Today we're looking at Sparrow Wallet, a feature-rich Bitcoin desktop wallet that doesn't sacrifice usability. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin pleb, and all around raging capitalist. And yes, in today's video, we're going to go into a Bitcoin desktop wallet that I don't think as many folks have uh, have seen or are aware of, and that is Sparrow Wallet. And when I'm looking at any of these wallets, um, there's typically trade-offs made across you know, dimensions like uh, security, privacy, usability. And so you're never going to be perfect across all three of those. It's simply not possible. But I think Sparrow has done a very, very nice job. I would say Sparrow is um, certainly a slightly more advanced wallet, uh, meaning it's very feature-rich, uh, it doesn't sort of leave anything out. It kind of presents you with all the information you could possibly need, but it does so in a more user-friendly way. I've heard some folks call Sparrow Wallet um, perhaps a more user-friendly version of something like Spectre. So you are in for a treat today. We're going to go through uh, the setup process, um, you know, basic single SIG uh, wallet creation, sending, receiving, all that good stuff and I'm sure we'll do future videos as well. For those returning to the channel, welcome back my friends. As always, it is great to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. I know there are many of you, about 80% of you watching right this very second are not currently subscribed. And so if you like this content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including wallet tutorials like this, uh, mining, you know, DeFi on Bitcoin, the Lightning Network, uh, news analysis, you name it, I cover it. But with all that out of the way, though, let's go ahead and jump into just a very brief high-level overview of what I think makes Sparrow unique. So in the intro, I mentioned that I, I really think Sparrow has done a nice job balancing across security, privacy, uh, and usability. It is certainly very feature rich, um, but you know that's that's ultimately what you want. Um, but they they do it in a way to where it's not totally overwhelming as a user. And so they've got you know full support for all manner of different uh, wallets, um, including you know a whole range of uh, hardware wallets. I will do a another video in the future with the foundation device um, passport, which I'm very very excited to uh, get my hands on very recently. They also sort of in the onboarding flow encourage users to use their own node. Now, obviously that's not gonna be everyone. Um, and in fact, may not be most of the folks kind of watching this uh, or using Sparrow Wallet for the first time, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but I like that they're sort of placing and embedding some of these best practices uh, into the flow without making it just sort of another hurdle. And you'll see what I mean by that when we jump in. Uh, gives you a ton of transparency and visibility into creating uh, transactions, coin control. You know, you can see your different UTXOs. Um, you can create and broadcast, you know, kind of exactly the transaction that you want. Uh, they support multi-sig very nicely. I will point that out briefly in today's video, but I won't do a sort of uh, deep dive into it. I'll probably save that for a future video, uh, but you guys can let me know uh, whether that's something you'd really want to see. Um, and, and finally, they support fully air-gapped Bitcoin transactions through partially signed uh, Bitcoin transactions with a variety of different um, hardware wallets, which is really nice. And finally, there's a few other bells and whistles. Uh, they use Argon2 as a st even stronger encryption method versus what some other wallets use uh, for their kind of password hashing. So um, so they, they clearly take, you know, privacy and security really, really seriously. Um, again, I think without sacrificing too much on the usability side. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in and see what it looks like. Started. Um, first, you'll want to come to sparrowwallet.com. 
Uh, of course, be very careful with this. You want to download from the right location. I will link all of this in the description down below, of course. Uh, and we'll also do the verification uh, with the download itself. So all we need to do is come over to the download button here or on the top here, and we will see uh, the different installers for uh, different operating systems. So for me, I'm going to do the uh, Windows installer, and then I'm also going to download the manifest and manifest signature because we're gonna use that to verify the release. All right, so the, if this is your first time uh, verifying a download, uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. I'm gonna follow the exact instructions that Sparrow lays out, which is through the command line, uh, which again, if you're not familiar with, uh, will look a little new, but fear not, if you just follow the instructions, it should be fine. Uh, there's also programs such as Cleopatra, which you can see down here uh, in my uh, kind of tab here, that, uh, that can also uh, facilitate this, and I've actually showed this in other videos. Um, but for now, I've downloaded all three of those files. So my installer, I'm not gonna uh, sort of do anything with this yet um, until I verify the, uh, the release and what I've actually done. And so I'm gonna come down to these instructions uh, and I can see that first it's asking me to, um, uh, to import the keys that I'm going to verify against. And I can do that through the uh, command line. So I'm gonna come over here and so I'm going to essentially type in exactly uh, what they have here. There we go. Okay, so as we can see, it's got a key. It's got the public key for Craig Raw, uh, which, is, uh, which is what I would expect. And it says once you once you have the required PGP keys, you can verify the release. Uh, so I've got these two uh, downloads as we just saw. And so I will go ahead and uh, get into my downloads directory with the following uh, command. And then I will also put in the, uh, the actual verification here. Uh, I should mention that you do have to have um, GPG sort of installed on your computer uh, for this to recognize everything, uh, but that's very easily done. I will provide a link in the description down below for how you can download that as well. So I'll go ahead and hit enter. And here we go. You should see the following if the verification was successful. And so I can indeed see that uh, we have a good signature from Craig Raw, and it is okay that I have this warning. It says this key is not certified with a trusted signature. That simply means that I have not myself sort of marked this key as being trusted uh, in my own kind of instance of GPG, so that is fine. Um, it does say if you do see this warning, a good step would be to check the key against other sources. Uh, for example, here, so let's go ahead and and so we can compare this here. This is just on a, again, it's it, the point here is comparing it to a different source. And indeed, I can go ahead and uh, click on this to see the full key. And I'm just quickly scanning to ensure that the fingerprint here matches. And indeed, it does. So great. Okay, so great. So we have verified the manifest file. Now we just want to do the actual kind of executable that I will run to install it. So if I scroll down again, in my case, it's Windows. I will go ahead and copy this and come back over, paste that in. And so I've got this hash value now. And so the final step is just to compare this to the text file uh, that we also download. So I'm gonna open this text file I'll open it with Notepad. And then what we can do is go to the executable here and verify that the hash is the same in both cases. And indeed they match, so we are good. 
So conceptually, what we just did is first we imported the keys from, uh, in this case, you know, Craig Raw, who's involved with this project, and we use the signature to check that it aligns with the manifest file. And we also hashed the installer uh, itself to verify that the, the result we got uh, matches up with a pre-known um, value that was in the manifest text file. Uh, but again, I'm not gonna delve too deep into that. The important part is just kind of completing these steps and ensuring that uh, we can comfortably proceed with installing the uh, software. So I will go ahead and do that now. Windows is trying to protect me, so I will uh, I'll hit run anyway. All right, so I am booting up Sparrow for the first time, and it gives me this little introduction. Sparrow is a Bitcoin wallet with a focus on security and usability. Um, Sparrow can operate in both an online and offline mode. In the online mode, it connects to a server to display transaction history. In the offline mode, it is useful as a transaction editor and as an error-gapped multi-sig coordinator. The status bar at the bottom displays the connection status as demonstrated below. So this is just showing you what that will look like. I'll hit next. Connecting to a public server, it says, if you are beginning your journey in self-custody or just storing a small amount, the easiest way to connect Sparrow to the Bitcoin blockchain is via one of the pre-configured public Electrum servers. However, although Sparrow only connects to servers that have a record of respecting privacy, it is still not ideal as you are sharing your transaction history and balance with them. Uh, a yellow toggle means that you are connected to a public server. And this is a great example of what I mean when they don't hide anything from the user. Now, this uses language that maybe you're not uh, as familiar with. So all this is saying is um, connecting to a public server is going to allow you to select one of several, uh, you know, well-known, um, you know, well-known node operators essentially. And that's the reality of what's happening behind the scenes anytime you're using a, uh, a third party, right? If you're not using your own node, you're using someone, el someone else's. And all this is saying is that that is less ideal, uh, particularly if you have you know, large amounts of funds that you're going to be storing because while of course your private key is never going to be uh, at, at risk, your uh, you know things like your balances and transaction history, given that the blockchain you know is a transparent ledger, uh, is shared with other entities. So again, I'd love to see this right from the get-go from Sparrow, uh, really explaining you know hey here's where you can start if you're just playing around or versus uh, other kind of setups if you're not. So I'll go ahead and hit next. And again, it says connecting to a Bitcoin Core node. So this would be if you're running uh, Bitcoin Core, um, you know, on whatever machine, you can configure Sparrow to connect to it directly. This means you are not sharing your transaction data, but be aware Bitcoin Core stores your balance, transactions, and public keys unencrypted on that node, which is not ideal for true cold storage. And then finally, we get uh, what is what what is called a private Electrum server. This is basically just means you're connecting to uh, your own node. Um, because these servers index all Bitcoin transactions equally, your wallet transactions are never stored on the server in an identifiable way and your server forgets your requests immediately after serving them. A blue toggle means you're connected to a private Electrum server. You're now ready to configure a server and start using Sparrow. So now that we've kind of read through that and understand it, we can go ahead and hit configure server. We are now presented with those three options that were just discussed. So as you can see, the public server option is by default. So if, you, if you're not running your own node of any kind, this would be the option that you would select. And you would uh, select from a couple well-known uh, entities. Uh, Blockstream is very, very good. Um, and so I'm you know, not as sure. I know Luke a little bit, but some of these other ones, I'm not as sure. Anything with Electrum is probably uh, reasonably trustworthy. They're not going to put anything in this list that is uh, totally nonsense, uh, but you at least have the option to choose, you know, whichever one you want. Um, and then you're able to test the connection and go ahead and create your new wallet. Now, what I'm going to do is actually connect this to my own node. For those of you who are running an Umbral node, uh, or perhaps, um, you know, uh, have heard of Umbral and like the idea, uh, and are thinking about it, um, I wanted to at least go through how to do that. So I'm actually gonna hit the private Electrum option. And now I'm seeing, I'm seeing that I have to provide a onion address 
uh, which will allow Sparrow to connect to my node uh, along with some other information. Now, the good news is that Umbral has very good instructions for how exactly to do this. So I'm gonna come over to Umbral and I'm gonna log into my node. I'm gonna go ahead and come over to connect wallet on the left. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Umbral, I've done uh, actually a couple videos on this now, um, which I'll link in the description down below. Um, but you'll see this you know, large range of options for connecting different wallets. And so the one we want is of course Sparrow. And this will give us some great instructions for how to do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and configure this and we'll be right back. Okay, so this is pretty easy. I have put in uh, the onion address associated with my node. Um, and then uh, I've left the use SSL off. And that's really all I should have to do. I'll go ahead and hit test connection. All right, so I can see the green check connected um, and I see my uh, umbral. So that is great. I'm now, uh, I've now connected Sparrow to my umbral node. I can go ahead and hit create new wallet. Again, don't worry about that. If you don't run your own node, that is, that is fine. And all you would do in that case is run the uh, public server option. And so let's go ahead and give a name for this wallet. Maybe I call it something like Sparrow1. And I'll hit create wallet. And now it gives me a couple of uh, final pieces to uh, apply in terms of settings for my wallet. You'll see the very first one is signal signature versus multi-signature. So I'll actually take a minute here just to show the multi-signature uh, sort of setup, but then the rest of this uh, kind of demo, I will use the single signature um, policy type as they call it. So multi-signature, for those not familiar, this is essentially a wallet where you need uh, multiple keys in order to unlock and send funds. Um, so for example, you might have a two of three multi-sig, which means there are three total keys that can unlock and send funds, and you need any two of them in order to actually do that. And so for example, if I were to hit the multi-signature option, I will see that uh, ability to kind of customize, you know, the number um, uh, here. And so, you know, this has, for example, uh, five of seven signers would be required. Uh, that is, you know, quite a lot. Um, but, you know, you could imagine doing something like a two of three, and perhaps connecting multiple hardware wallets that you have uh, for each of them. And then what you would do is, given that I've selected three here, I now have three key stores along the bottom. And so for each of them, I can uh, connect whatever it is, right? So I could uh, connect a hardware wallet, um, you know, directly connected into my computer. I could do so in an air-gapped fashion with uh, using kind of a, a micro SD card or something like that. Um, I could also uh, just create a sort of uh, spare, a, a normal Sparrow wallet and use that as one of my signers, uh, or I could import something like uh, an Electrum wallet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you would go through that process uh, and hit apply, and that is how you would set up your, uh, your multi-sig. Now again, we're just going to do the single SIG just to keep the uh, subsequent demo a little bit simpler. And that is really uh, all we have to do. Now we can choose from the bottom which of those options we want. I'll leave things with native SegWit here at the top. And so again, I'm gonna do future videos where I connect a hardware wallet in an air-gapped fashion. Uh, but for now, we're just going to do a new uh, sort of regular Sparrow wallet, if, we, if you will. So for this software wallet option, it now presents me with a couple different ways that I can do this. Uh, I could enter a private key from another um, sort of system and kind of import that uh, wallet. I could import a file. So um, for those who are familiar with Electrum, and again, I've done a video on Electrum as well, you can actually export a file um, and you know bring it into something like Sparrow. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to create um, our seed based on a mnemonic uh, phrase uh, or a backup phrase. And you even have a drop down. You can kind of uh, choose however many you want. I'm gonna go ahead just because this is for kind of test purposes and do uh, 12 words. And I'll go ahead and hit uh, generate new. 
And then um, optionally, I can create a passphrase. Um, I would say this is this is recommended uh, just to give some additional security. Again, though, for purposes of this demo, I'm not going to do that. So I'll hit generate new, and it will give me uh, 12 words. And so I will write down these words and be right back to confirm the backup. All right, so I've written my 12 words down. I'll go ahead and hit confirm backup. And yes, they have. And so now I will re-enter them uh, to validate that I've actually written them down. And then after that, I'll hit cre create key store. So I'll do that and come right back. All right, excellent. So I can now go ahead and hit import key store. And I now have things loaded. I can view my you know, seed if I want, um, the master fingerprint associated with uh, this wallet, as well as my XPUB at the bottom. And now all I need to do is hit apply. And it will ask me whether I want to add a password to the wallet. Um, highly recommend that you uh, indeed do this and we'll set our password. All right, so this is all loaded up. Um, we can now start to explore. Now, of course, this is a brand new wallet, so there won't be any uh, transactions here. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll change that here really soon. Uh, there's your normal send and receive tabs. Now, this kind of illustrates my point earlier, right? This is pretty nicely arranged here on the left. Um, but then within each of them, you do have a good degree of flexibility and freedom. Um, uh, and so we'll go through each of these in turn. Uh, but you have your send tab, uh, your receive tab, your uh, addresses that, um, you know, that can be uh, associated with the... Uh, with the seed here, uh, your UTXOs. So let's say you have multiple uh, different transactions that have come in from different you know, addresses. You can kind of um, manage them. And so the whole coin control uh, piece is, uh, is here. Uh, and then of course the settings which we had gone through. So let's go ahead and receive some Bitcoin. So I'll go first to the receive tab and I'm going to copy this address and I'm going to come over to a different uh, system. Uh, I'm coming over to my Wasabi wallet and I will use that to, uh, to send. And as we can see, uh, we've got a, uh, it comes up with a notification, new mempool transactions. We can head over to our transactions and see that indeed we have an unconfirmed that is inbound. Uh, and so we'll let this get confirmed and be right back. All right, so we've got a uh, confirmation. So you can see here, uh, it'll count to probably six, I would assume, uh, which is generally considered to be just, you know, like you are never reversing that transaction uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so that's nice that it'll count it out. Um, but great, we can now look at a few other things so if we go over to our UTXOs uh, panel, we will now see that we have an entry in our table um, associated with the particular address. And so imagine having uh, many of these, right? You know, I could add different labels. Um, in fact, that's odd. I did add a label in Wasabi, but maybe it, uh, it didn't go through. But in any case, you can uh, select these different pieces and um, you know, you can send specific UTXOs, uh, you can group specific UTXOs. What's also quite interesting is they have this mix selected uh, option. And so this is actually pretty fascinating. I had no idea they had a Whirlpool client. I wonder why that is uh, not something they broadcast in particular. Maybe it's quite new. Um, but in any case, for those not familiar with the concept of coin join, it's this idea of um, you know multiple participants combining their inputs or their UTXOs into a single transaction and applying different logic that obfuscates the sort of ownership of those different UTXOs. So you'll still get back the same amount minus the fees uh, that go to the uh, sort of coin join um, service. Uh, but if someone were to then on you know the blockchain inspect those um, those coins, they wouldn't be able to kind of piece together and connect the history of those coins 
with the fact that you know you now have them. So it's a way uh, to enhance your privacy. Now, I've done uh, whole videos on CoinJoin, uh, particularly the implementation within Wasabi Wallet. And I will say that um, you know you can you can bet that regulators are going to uh, going to want to you know somehow crack down on this. Uh, we've already seen certain cases of third parties like exchanges uh, contact and reach out to users saying, "Hey, we you know we noticed that you deposited some funds that appear to be, from what we can tell, uh, were you know were mixed. Like, what's the deal, right?" And I don't think we've seen any really serious implications of that yet, but it's something to be aware of. Um, but it's really, really cool that they've actually built this uh, directly into Sparrow. Um, I, I knew they supported CoinJoin, although I thought they used uh, PayJoin as the implementation. Samurai is a really, really solid um, uh, sort of mixer, and I guess it goes through some of the different uh, instructions here. So I won't go through this in detail, but this might be a great topic for another video. I would just say, again, be wary of the fact that um, there have been instances where, uh, again, if you know, if for whatever reason you have to sell, God forbid, um, and you know, you deposit uh, some Bitcoin to an exchange, uh, there have been certain cases, I don't think with any really well-known uh, exchanges, but with some of the more peripheral uh, exchanges, uh, there have been cases where users have been contacted and asked uh, sort of what the heck. And so, of course, that's very against the ethos of, uh, of Bitcoin in terms of censorship resistance. Nonetheless, uh, we'll go ahead and cancel that. Um, so a couple cool things you can do here in the UTXOs tab. Um, again, we had already looked at the addresses tab. Um, there are a few advanced things you can do on this page I won't get into in this video. Um, and then finally, let's, let's go and send uh, some of our Bitcoin. All right, so there's quite a lot here, quite a lot of flexibility to kind of create um, your transaction exactly as you wish. Uh, you can either paste in an address or use uh, a camera on your computer if you have a QR code that you're trying to scan. Note that you can also add uh, multiple recipient addresses, which is really nice. Um, so you can kind of toggle between um, uh, multiple uh, addresses. You can add a bunch. So that is a nice uh, option. You can uh, label, which is always a good practice for coin control. Um, there is a uh, sort of full sliding range fee, which is nice. Sometimes uh, wallets kind of simplify it and say, you know, fast, medium, slow, uh, but it's nice that they give you that kind of full uh, transparency. And what's really nice is they've built this little mempool tool uh, into this, which is super cool. Um, mempool, if anyone is not uh, familiar, uh, is actually what I was just checking uh, behind this to see when my uh, transaction that I sent into Sparrow confirmed. Um, but it's essentially the different transactions that are in uh, what is called the mempool. Uh, the mempool is sort of like a purgatory, if you will, uh, where transactions sit in a particular node's mempool um, until they are picked up by miners. So this gives you a sense of how busy the mempool is. Uh, which can help you kind of configure, um, you know, the priority with which you set your fee. Now, I'm glad uh, I'm glad I did a bit of extra uh, research on this final piece at the bottom, which is super cool. And indeed, uh, I've I did a bit of research right now. Um, today is uh, September 24th, and indeed, there's a few stories from just a few hours ago on this latest release of Sparrow. Um, including the Samurai Whirlpool uh, technology that we were just looking at in the UTXOs tab, which is really cool. Uh, the other place in which that comes in is this optimized for either efficiency or privacy. And so if you toggle this privacy button, uh, what's going to happen is it will use a tool that Samurai has developed called Stonewall to add additional entropy or randomness that creates doubt about being able to trace the inputs and outputs of the transaction. Now, I have not done uh, anywhere near enough research to uh, kind of understand the intricacies of how that works. So I'm not gonna comment on that in today's video, uh, but this could indeed be a great topic for a future video. I've been meaning to cover Samurai Wallet and all the great uh, features that they enable their users. So this is really, really cool. It's uh, it's you know serendipitous that today we decided to do this uh, uh, video. Um, but it's really cool to see Samurai's tools being embedded in other, um, other tools like Sparrow. And so 
Uh, let's go ahead and create our transaction. So I've got a uh, receive address from a different wallet. So I'll go ahead and just paste that in. Uh, I'll go ahead and give a label. So this is my uh, Wasabi wallet. Uh, I'll go ahead and send, maybe we can say 100,000 uh, sats. And you can see that as soon as I did that, I've now have uh, a lot of the other pieces here that are populated. And so I can, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm really in a rush, I can slide this up and you can see how uh, the fees, you know, change. Um, I'm not in any particular rush, so I'll, I'll, keep it, uh, I'll keep it pretty darn low. You can also just hard code a specific fee amount that you want. Um, let's go ahead just for kicks and hit the privacy option. I'm curious if anything special happens. So I'll go ahead and now hit uh, create transaction. We've got everything configured, the address, uh, the fee amount, etc. So I actually went back and toggled it to efficiency just to see if there was something uh, different, but it actually looks exactly the same. So again, if you were to exit out of this and go back to this screen, it doesn't appear that there are any additional parameters that you would have to input uh, if you were to select the privacy. So it just sort of uses the Stonewall um, uh, tool kind of behind the scenes. So again, Pretty interesting. Uh, in this case, I'll just go forward with efficiency, but know that that is there. And I may do a video uh, in the future where I go into depth into um, into Stonewall, which is uh, pretty cool. So I'll go ahead and hit create transaction. And this will present me with um, just kind of final sort of recap, uh, the transaction ID that I can track. Um, we don't really need to worry about any of this. I can go ahead and hit finalize transaction for signing. And so depending on the configuration, um, again, if you were using a, um, if you were using a uh, hardware wallet that you were connected to, you'd be able to load in a partially signed uh, Bitcoin transaction, um, et cetera. Uh, or if you, if you were uh, sort of exporting this transaction to be signed by your hardware wallet, you would be able to do that using the save partially signed Bitcoin transaction uh, or alternatively the, uh, the QR code that you could scan with certain hardware wallets that support partially signed Bitcoin transactions with QR codes as opposed to uh, the sort of file that you would pass back and forth on your micro SD. In our case, it's pretty simple. We can just hit sign and I will put in my wallet password. All right, so I have applied the signature. I can view the final transaction if I want, or alternatively, the very final step is to broadcast the transaction. So I will go ahead and do that. And we can now see that it is, uh, we've uh, successfully created the transaction. It's currently unconfirmed. I can come back and uh, see that in my transactions. And so there you go. We've got uh, the 100,000 sats plus the fee. And so there you have it. Um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, pretty lucky timing that we happen to do this uh, with this latest release of Sparrow that incorporates some very cool uh, privacy features from Samurai. Um, but uh, there's a couple other obviously um, menus along the top. You know, file. You can create new wallets directly from uh, here, uh, or create uh, transactions um, from different uh, files. So again, we'll show in future videos um, some of the different ways to do partially signed. Bitcoin transactions. Uh, you can import wallets, export wallets, all that good stuff, uh, and change the way that you view certain things, like what's your standard uh, default unit for Bitcoin. Uh, do you want to do light or dark? It's the year 2021, so you know I'm about to do dark. Uh, that uh, actually looks pretty slick. Um, maybe I should reshoot this whole demo, but uh, not. maybe that's for another day. Um, there's a couple other final tools. So there you have it. Let's go ahead and wrap this video up. All right, my friends, there you have it. Uh, just as a quick recap, we took a look at Sparrow Wallet, which has done a really nice job um, really emphasizing security and privacy uh, without sacrificing too much, I think, on the usability side, which is really important. As more and more people, you know, this I don't think is necessarily the kind of intro uh, wallet, the first, you know, desktop wallet that you, you'd ever have for Bitcoin. Uh, but I do think it is a really, really nice feature rich um, wallet that as you become more comfortable in the ecosystem, uh, this is a, a really, really good option um, that supports a wide range of setups and use cases. And in future videos, I'm going to go into connecting uh, hardware wallets to, um, uh, to Sparrow and show what that looks like. 
Uh, but what do you think? I would love to hear what you, uh, what you think in the comments down below. Uh, I hope you found this video valuable and useful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like. Comment down below, as I said. Let me know your thoughts, questions on this video or on topics and themes that you'd like to see covered in future videos. I really do take that into consideration when making the schedule for the channel. Uh, but for now, we'll go ahead and leave all this here. As always, every sack counts, my friends. And until next time, I'll see you then.